And so today I'm pleased to welcome acclaimed author and historian Frank DeCotter, who is with us to discuss Mao's Great Famine, the history of China's most devastating catastrophe. Of Mao's Great Fam Famine, Kirkus Reviews write that, writes that it is a direct, hard-hitting study of China's great leap forward in light of newly opened archival material, horrifically eye-opening work of a dark period of Chinese history that desperately cries out for further examination. And from the Sunday Times, it is a work of brilliant scholarship that finally reveals the full extent of the horrors visited on the Chinese people by Mao during the Great Leap Forward. Meticulous. It is hard to exaggerate the achievement of this book in proving that Mao caused the famine. Frank D. Cotter is Chair Professor of Humanities at the University of Hong Kong and Professor of the Modern History of China at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Previous works include The Discourse of Race in Modern China and Narcotic Culture, A History of Drugs in China. We're absolutely thrilled to have him with us today, so will you please join me in welcoming Frank DeCotter. I happen to like bookshops very much. I spend a lot of time in them. And it strikes me that when you walk into a bookshop, whether it's in London, in Hong Kong, or here in Cambridge, um, there's an awful lot you can read on some of the great horrors of the 20th century. For instance, take the Holocaust. The wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book by Saul Friedlander is on sale over here. Not to mention other more recent books, for instance, by Christopher Browning, Escape from Nazi Slave Labor Camps. If you look at Solzhenitsyn, the classics on, on the Gulag, He's very much on sale here, as well as more recent work by, for instance, one of my favorite authors, uh, Simon Sebag Montefiore. But what about the great leap forward? Is that not one of the great horrors of the 20th century? Well, I believe it is. I think that if you take Pol Pot and what he did in Cambodia, and you multiply that by about 20, now we get somewhere close to what happened in China between 1958 and 1962. Why is there so little in bookshops? Um, well, there's a very good reason for that. The regime that perpetrated these crimes against humanity is very much in power today. There's another reason for it. There's very little documentation available. Unlike the collapse of Nazi Germany, unlike the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, China is still very much in power today. The Communist Party of China is in power today. These archives are only very gradually opening up. So when 10 years ago a book came out on the topic by a journalist called Jasper Becker, um, it was actually poo-pooed by many people in the field because it didn't have adequate footnotes. Well, what I did is I spent about four years researching this book, and out of those four years there were six months spent in archives party archives that were opening up very gradually in the years running up to the Olympics. So for a very limited period of time, there was a window of opportunity for historians with a good letter of accreditation to get into these archives and start reading on these events that happened some, some 50, uh, 60 years ago. Um, I looked at literally hundreds of documents, hundreds of documents that range from ordinary letters written by people and addressed sometimes to the chairman Mao, sometimes to the head of state, sometimes to a local newspaper. It goes to extremely detailed reports about mass murder written up by teams that went into countryside at the very end of the famine, 1960, 1961. There are self-confessions self by leaders of provinces which presided over the deaths of millions of people, for instance in the case of Gansu province. Extremely rich material that has not been used hitherto in researching this topic. So let me get one thing out of the way right away. What, what are the numbers? How many people died during this event? One reads and hears about so rarely well, on the basis of an extraordinary range of material that comes, for instance, from investigations done by public security bureaus at the level of an entire province like Sichuan. Sichuan is twice the size of France. Here we, had, here we have the head of this bureau who uses everybody at his disposal in that province in 1962 to count how many people died unnecessarily. And he comes up with a number of 8 to 10 million people in that one province alone. 8 to 10 million people who died unnecessarily. Once you start seeing this material and you compile it, 
one cannot escape the conclusion that at least 45 million people died unnecessarily from 1958 to 1962. I still can't get my head around that number. It's an extraordinary number, num number of people. It must rank surely as one of the great three horrors of the 20th century, if not the greatest case of man-made disaster in all of human history. But it's not just the mere numbers. In fact, the title is quite this misleading. It says Mao's Great Famine. Famine brings to mind this notion of, of misguided policies in which gradually food disappears and people die, starve to death. Whereas what this one-party state reveals in its extremely detailed documentation, all one-party states, under Stalin, under Hitler, under Mao, keep extremely detailed records. Once you start reading it, what comes across very clearly is the extraordinary amount of violence that was exercised from 1958 to 1962. Violence, by that I mean people being beaten to death for having stolen a mere handful of grain. The case of Wang Ziyou, for instance, is reported to the top leadership. Here's a man for having stolen a potato he has his legs tied up with iron wire. Somebody dumps a 10 kilo stone on his back. One of his ears is chopped off, and finally he's branded with a sizzling tool. In one small village in Hunan province, Xiong De Chang, who is a local leader, forces a man to bury his own son alive. Here's a 12-year-old kid who has stolen a handful of grain. The father is obliged, forced to bury him alive. He dies of grief three weeks later. Across the country, from archive to archive, there are abundant examples of the use of extraordinary levels of violence to get people to do things that were, they weren't very keen on doing. People were drenched in urine. They were covered in excrement. They were buried alive, something that happened quite a lot in Hunan province. They were branded with tools, they had their noses chopped off, their ears lopped off. Levels of violence that one can only explain by looking at what exactly happened during this period. Now what Mao had in mind with this great leap forward is to create a, a giant army to transform every man and every woman into some sort of soldier in a giant army with brigades, with, with commanders, with small armies that could tackle one task after the other in a giant continuous revolution. And by doing that, he herded people in the countryside in giant collectives called people's communes. And before you know it, everything was collectivized. People had their land taken away from them. It was only distributed to them a few years earlier. The houses were taken away. The cattle vanished. The tools were collectivized. Very little remained. The food, most importantly, was distributed by the spoonful in collective canteens according to merit. So before you know it, every single incentive to actually work is being stripped away from ordinary villagers who know very well that even if they grow the grain, the grain will be procured by the state. Even if they work in the fields in the evening, they will get a mere greenish concoction out of a big pot of soup. So as every incentive is stripped away, the cadres on the ground, the party officials, on the other hand, have to ruthlessly whip up that workforce. They themselves are confronted to the possibility of being purged from the party. They must fulfill and overfulfill new sets of quotas, fingers, numbers, overfulfill the plan, produce more grain, more this, more that. And they themselves have to whip up that workforce. So as that carrot is taken away, as all these incentives are gradually stripped, nothing but a stick remains. In some parts of the countryside, carders, the party officials, and farmers are so brutalized uh, that the scope of coercion has to be constantly expanded, creating a mounting spiral of violence in which ever greater means of coercion have to be used by Carlos to get famished people back into the fields to do some kind of work. So this is one big thing about this period, the extraordinary extent of the violence exercised by party people against ordinary people. About six to eight percent of people didn't die of hunger. They died because they were buried alive. 
They were summarily executed. They were tortured to death. That makes about two to three million people who died violently during this period alone, 58 to 62. But much more effective than a cane to pummel or whip somebody is actually the use of food. And this is something else that comes across very clearly in all that meticulously detailed documentation of that period. The use of food as a weapon, rather than force somebody with a stick to go and work, it is much more effective for carders who preside over collective canteens, who have the food in their hands, to actually deliberately ban people from the canteen if they are seen to be too weak, too vulnerable, too old, too sick to contribute to the food supply. Don't forget, during this period, people are reduced to mere digits. They're nothing but numbers on a balance sheet. The state is everything. The individual is nothing. Just a resource to be used, exploited in the name of a greater future and a greater good, like coal or like grain. It's very tempting for some of these carders on the ground to actually extrapolate from these rather macabre calculations and see people as mere livestock. After all, once you collectivize people, you put them into collective barracks, collective canteens, put the children into collective kindergartens, you actually have to feed them, you have to house them, you have to clothe them. And as there is increased starvation, as it starts spreading by 1950 already, and sets in by the winter of 58, 59, becomes very tempting to simply cut off those people who simply don't contribute enough to the food supply. In other words, there's a deliberate use of food as a weapon to starve people seen to be too weak to earn their keep. It goes back to a very simple principle which Lenin announced rather clearly. He who does not work shall not eat. And that is very much the principle that becomes a guiding rule during those years of masturbation. If you can't work, you won't eat. People are given work points, but those who can't make enough points are simply banned from the canteen. Those who speak out are banned from the canteen. Those who fall asleep in the fields are banned from the canteen. In some cases, entire villages are cut off from the canteen with extraordinarily high starvation rates. So this is the other discovery that comes through these, this massive documentation of the time, namely the fact that people didn't simply starve, they were starved. There's a great distinction here between starvation and deliberately starving groups of people to death. So far, I've spoken about human beings and the destruction of large quantities of them in the name of a better future. But collectivization did a lot more than, dis than just destroy human beings. If you look at famines, for instance, in Bengal or in Ireland well over a century ago, um, of course, people themselves start selling bricks from their own houses, might eat the thatch on the top of, of, of their hut might use a door frame for fuel. But what you see here is that radical collectivization destroys not just human beings, but just about everything inside that collectivized realm. Take, for instance, housing, not something that immediately springs to mind when we talk about famine, a very loose word used here in the title. Housing, up to 40% of housing vanishes in a province like Hunan, as reported by number two, a man called Liu Shaoqi, in a private letter addressed to number one called Mao Zedong. 40% of private housing has been destroyed. Why? For all sorts of reasons. First, for fertilizer. Initially, it seems like a good idea that you might take a mud hut in which, in which animals have been kept and in which some organic matter has been left behind and pulverize it and distribute it over the fields. But in the pursuit of ever higher quotas, the destruction of houses becomes part and parcel of collectivization 1958. 
In other cases, houses are destroyed to build a better village. Here, after all, is communism beckoning ahead. Why be content with the backward village? Why not just destroy it and build up something much better? Of course, very little is built during those years. The destruction, on the, on the other hand, takes away houses of ordinary people. And what about these collective canteens, collective kindergartens, collective barracks? They too have to be built, and the bricks have to come from somewhere. Uh, people contribute, but most of, most, in most cases, they're actually obliged to give away entire parts of their housing. Houses are destroyed as a form as, as, of punishment. Bit by bit, farmers start hiding the grain. A war takes place between those officials who represent the state and must procure grain at ever-increasing rates, and the farmers who try to hide it as best as they, they can in order to help themselves and their families to survive. Frequently, houses are destroyed uh, in, in the search for grain by the state or as a simple measure of punishment. How about nature? Nature, too, sustains an attack that it has never seen previously. In some parts of the country, up to half of the forest disappears. Massive irrigation work, conserv water conservancy measures, in which hundreds of millions of farmers throughout these four years have to work for weeks on end on gigantic projects, building dams, digging canals, making a reservoir. A lot of it uh, is very poorly conceived and very poorly executed. So there are landslides, river siltation, soil alkalinization, all sorts of very negative effects on the natural environment. Here is a team led by Hu Yaobang, who you may have heard of, a great official who in 1961 spends three months traveling across the basin of the, the Yellow River and the Huai River. And he comes up with one conclusion when he is asked to explain why there are such devastating inundations right bang in the middle of the Great Leap Forward. This conclusion is very simple. With all these massive water conservancy measures, by digging ill-conceived canals and reservoirs, that whole natural water system has been destroyed. Transportation grinds to a, to a halt. Is an extremely wasteful system that wishes to pretty much move people and grain from one part of the country to the next. In the case of Hunan province, for instance, tons and tons of grain are being collected and are waiting by the side of the road. Yet there's nothing there to collect it. There's not enough fuel. Transportation system creaks to a halt. In one railway station, Zhengzhou, people dig a ditch that's six meters deep to dump machinery, cement, in some cases bags of food that nobody can collect. It's part of the collective system. It's part of that great command economy that sends goods from one part of the country to the other, but there's simply not the means available to execute it. Extraordinary waste at every single level. So far, I've talked about destruction, but I have about 10 minutes left and I want to talk about something else. Uh, this is, after, a, after all, a book written very much about ordinary people, and not just ways of dying, but also ways of surviving. Many people died, but even more somehow managed to get through this extraordinary catastrophe. And the archives there, again, give you extraordinarily detailed evidence of the kind of strategies that people used on an everyday basis to get through some of that horror. And the most common strategy is simply to try to not work at all, to conserve energy. So apathy at work, whether it's in the factory or in the countryside, apathy at work is not just the result of malnutrition. It's a strategy. People become masters of time theft. In the countryside, for instance, farmers will work under the watchful eye of a local official. But once the man's, very often a man, once the man is gone, well, just drop the tools, sit by the field, and wait and rest. In some cases, where local village leaders somehow side with the farmers, 